Hello, this is News Now from the Belmont Journal, and we are joined by Lisa Gibellario, a prevention specialist with Wayside Youth and Family Support Network and coordinator of the Belmont Wellness Coalition. And I'm your host, Mike Crowley. Today, we're talking about the shifting of our children's friend, friend groups and how parents can support kids when that happens. Lisa, can you tell us what shifting friend groups means? Sure. So it's a fairly common thing that happens from preschool all the way up, you know, to full grown adults. Friendships are organic um, and they shift over time. And this shifting can be a natural um, occurrence. You know, you might, your child might be at the Butler and hanging out with kids who are predominantly at that elementary school. And then they move on to the Chenery and they meet new kids. And so naturally new friendships will form. Um, you know, if kids shift activities, new friendships will form. And so this is the kind of thing that happens throughout life, as I said. What we're going to talk about today though, Mike, is, is when it's not a natural shifting. When your child is still very much you know, engaged in soccer or um, whatever activity they're engaged in, and all of a sudden they find themselves alone on the sidelines. All of a sudden they're not getting asked to participate in play dates after school or you know, the post game events. Um, back in our pre-pandemic days when things like that happened more common. So what we're gonna talk about is when your child finds themselves alone, um, when they find that a group is still together, but they're no longer um, a part of the group. So that's kind of the more painful, also very common and natural, but a more painful shifting of friend groups. So it's an interesting topic, Lisa, because you know even even um, in my own family, we've, we've dealt with that situation with, with my child. Um, so how can parents support their kids when this happens? So as we talk about frequently, Mike, first and foremost, um, set aside some time to check in with the predominant goal being to listen. Um, without a response, right? Reflective listening, we talk about that a lot, validating, um, so you repeat what you hear. Um, you can certainly ask some clarifying questions. Questions are good. You can check in, ah, oh, you know, how did you feel when that happened? What do you think is going on? But the key here is for parents to remain neutral, not to be reactive, to neutrally absorb what your child is sharing. It is just one piece of, of the big picture, it is your child's perspective. Um, so your role is to just absorb it and ask clarifying questions. Ask how you can help. That's a great question to ask. Um, see if you guys can brainstorm together um, some possible ways a child might move through this. Um, you know, Help them develop some strategies. Help them come up with ways in which they could um, follow up with someone in the friend group. Perhaps there's someone who they feel safe with, who they could reach out to and ask for some understanding. Um, always keep the conversation open. These are not one-off conversations. Um, it's not like, check, you know, I, I, I asked about this situation, now we can move on. You're going to wanna go back. Most of the time, these things are ongoing. Um, they will change, again, very organic. Um, Use this opportunity, um, parents, to talk about friendships in general and how to be a good friend. Um, use examples from media, from television, or from books that you read together. So there are, there are lots of positive things that we can do. Um, and it's mostly about listening and checking in and being available. So, so let me ask you, Lisa, is there anything that parents um, should perhaps not do in, in working with their children? Yes, um, there, there are things, and, and some of them are harder than others because when you see your child left out, when you see your child in pain, it is really hard not to try to dive in and fix the situation. And I too, Mike, have been there, and it is extremely painful to witness um, it's, it's painful to just see your child hurting, right? So we wanna fix the problem, but we can't. There, we just, it's not appropriate for us to dive in um, to try to solve the problem. So we're going to, again, explore with our child. The other thing that we're advised not to do is to you know, start contacting other adults. Um, mm -hmm. 
reaching out to parents, reaching out to school, um, providing, of course, that we don't suspect bullying. If we think our child is being targeted, if, if our child is coming home with stories that seem to map to bullying, which is repeated you know, um, insults or repeated harm, um, then we do want to then we do want to reach out to the school guidance counselor or the teacher and say, look, we need another pair of eyes on this situation or reach out to a parent who, again, we trust, who we feel comfortable with. And when, when we do reach out to other parents, if we reach out to other parents, we're not doing it with our child's story in mind. We're doing it with uh, more of the framework of, hey, we have a situation here. Can you help me understand what you know to be true based on what you've witnessed or you've heard from your child? We're going in with the framework of help me understand so that I can help my child. Um, very important to, again, try to stay neutral because we, we're only seeing our child's um, perspective. So we don't also want to assume, Mike, that our children are the victims. Our children may be playing a more active role in what's happening than mm -hmm. they are revealing to us. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Our children may, our child may appear victimized, but they may have a role. So to flip that on the positive side, we can ask our children that. What do you think your role in this um, friendship shifting is? You know, what, what would another, if I were to ask one of your, you know, former friends, what would they say? You know, what would they say is going on? So we don't want to assume our children are the victim. We don't want to jump in and necessarily start, again, fixing the problem, contacting other adults. But that is not off the table. These situations are fluid. And um, that may be something that you do want to do down the road is reach out. But just know that they're fluid situations. And, you know, be available and see if you can brainstorm, you know, ways in which your child can get through it. Now, Lisa, can I ask when when you when you suggested that parents not reach out to other parents, are th are there ways that parents can be helpful and and still still reach out to other parents without without um, um, make, making you know in an attempt to um, so so for example, um, if one potential solution um, in in working with my child is the thought you know why don't we organize some additional play dates. I mean, would it, would it not then be appropriate to reach out to other parents to organize the play date? Absolutely. So let me clarify, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we should reach out to other parents in a fit of anger, yeah. um, feeling that our child has been betrayed, feeling upset, feeling like we want to fix the problem. However, yeah. I think it's absolutely appropriate to reach out to other parents with a framework of, hey, my kid's going through something here. Maybe we can get the kids together. Maybe you can help me understand what you've learned to be true about what's going on. What have you seen? So I would say it is appropriate to reach out to other parents so long as we're not trying to fix the problem or quite honestly, so long as we don't have an ax to grind, right? So you see the difference. We're, yeah. we're reaching out to help our child to piece together maybe more of the story, but not to fix or accuse or out of anger. All right. Well, um, any, any other thoughts then, Lisa, before we close? Um, I would just say before we close, Mike, I want to validate folks out there that that have seen their children um, go through this again, it is very painful. It's it's a tough thing to witness and it happens um, you know, not even necessarily um, person to person shifting, but it can be that your child was texting a group of kids, you know, there were, you know, seven kids from the soccer team that they were all together on a group chat type thing. And all of a sudden, they haven't gotten any chats and they put together that they've been dropped from that group chat. So mm -hmm. I just want to also add that this isn't just something that happens in real time and in, in real person to person, it can happen electronically, it can happen with social media. So just to say that it's painful, but um, hang in there. It, it, often kids find their way through it. And it's one of those character building experiences. It can make them be a more empathetic friend down the road. Um, and again, just to help them identify if they may have something that they could have done better. You know, what is their role in it? So just listen, navigate together, explore together, check in. Um, it usually does get better. Um, and it's difficult when you're in the middle of it. 
All right, Lisa, this is so helpful. If you're a parent, this is something you and your children, you know, probably have faced. And, and so this is very, very helpful advice. Um, thank you, Lisa. And, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Mike.